don't have any pictures of that to show it myself, show myself at least not from the lab, so I thought I'd start with uh, a natural example, some uh, ice crystals that I once was lucky enough to see uh, during a hike to a canyon in Plot Canyon in Utah. No idea how this formed, but these ice crystals were a couple of inches long and formed this open lattice work, uh, lattice work for about a mile through the bottom of this canyon. Uh, so uh, it's not just uh, clever professors who can make uh, pretty awful code matter, but the native as well too. Uh, okay, so I hope you uh, guys are going to find your second win and uh, we'll be able to uh, get a bit of uh, enjoyment out of my second lecture. Uh, we're going to stick to the topic of quantum control. And uh, as you hopefully remember, well, this was Tuesday morning uh, this week, uh, we talked about control science, we talked about qubits and qubit control. And uh, today, I'm planning to up the ante, rather than talking about two-level systems, I'll talk about d-level systems. Uh, and that, of course, turns out to be a good bit more complicated. But before I do so, uh, I didn't quite finish what I had hoped to say about qubit control in an optical lattice. And in particular, there's an aspect of this work here that I was going to use as a jump-off point for something in today's lecture. So I'm just going to go back uh, and continue uh, one last part of, of Tuesday's lecture and then build off. So hopefully that will also remind us a little bit about some of the ideas and concepts uh, that we saw then. So remember that I was talking about the problem of addressing atoms uh, in an optical lattice. We have our three-dimensional optical lattice making, made up of standing waves so that atoms attract at sites that are half an optical wave at the heart. And uh, even though you can, in principle, resolve that with Marcus Greiner's quantum gas microscope, uh, so in our case, uh, we don't have that capability, and it's kind of hard anyway to get the lens, uh, a big enough lens close enough in a three-dimensional lattice. Uh, but we have qubits in this uh, stand in uh, this optical lattice. In our case, it's cesium, but it doesn't really matter. You, we have a pair of uh, spin states in the hyperplane ground state that encodes our qubit. And then what we do is we put this super lattice on that makes a long period standing wave, so that if you look at the sites, uh, of the trapping lattice along the x direction, right? Then the transition Your frequency for atoms at each individual site undergoes this long period sinusoidal modulation, and then the idea is that we can address uh, individual atoms via their frequency uh, at certain points in the standing wave. And this was, in particular, what we were interested in doing. We wanted to use these ideas of doing robust control uh, by phase modulated microwave pulses to perform a certain quantum operation on atoms in a frequency band, and then outside we wanted to do nothing at all. Uh, and this was so as to have some robustness in case the relative position of the two lattices were not constant, so that these positions of these uh, sites in frequency space would jitter around. So by modulating the phase of the microwave driving field, you could get this kind of top hat response where the probability of the spin flip was high in a certain frequency band and zero outside. And so we prepared atoms at three adjacent sites, flipped the middle one, left these two guys alone. And indeed we saw that you could do that in an experiment. Right here we have the three peaks. Uh, blue curve here shows what happens with this uh, pulse of the top hat response. You can completely remove the guys in the center by flipping the spin. Now, so that's just the lead-in, a reminder from Tuesday morning's lecture. Uh, the point that I want to make is a somewhat subtle one. So spin flip, going from down to up, there are different ways in which we can do that. What we're doing here is we're putting on an effector transverse magnetic field and rotating from down to up. But you could also have an incoherent process that did that like optical pumping, right? So it could be an optical pumping process that would take any state into the spin-up state, including the spin-down state. That's not very interesting for, for very many purposes, certainly not for things like quantum information processing. We want the process to be coherent. So uh, how do we sample that? Well, we try to put our pi pulse, our spin flip, together out of two 
pi over 2 rotations. Now, the way we had actually designed this pulse here, remember the way you design these pulses is that you ask your computer to vary the parameters, that is, all these spaces, in order to optimize something. And what we asked that computer to do here was to optimize the population of the spin-up state after the pulse. Now, that's not the same as say, telling the computer to do a rotation, say, around the x-axis by pi. Because doing a rotation around the y-axis by pi would accomplish the same thing. So in some sense, we're not asking the computer to do the same unitary transformation across this passband. We're just asking it to, to do a unitary transformation that takes us from down to up. If I did the same thing, uh, trying to go from, say, down to the spin along x, and I just say optimize the population of spin along the spin up state along x after the pulse, again, there would be many different rotations that could accomplish that. So if I start down along x, I do a pi over 2 rotation around y, I accomplish that. But if I do put a rotation axis on that are 45 degrees in the xc plane, and then do a pi rotation, I also end up uh, with spin up along x. But those are two completely two different unitaries. Now if I put rotation by pi over 2 along y together with another back-to-back -back pulse that does the same, I end up in the spin-up state. But if I put this rotation together, so on this 45 degree axis I do a pi rotation, and I do another one of those, I end up in the spin-down state. Okay? So, I'm not asking the computer to do the right thing here. Asking the computer to optimize the transfer between two quantum states say from down to up along x, uh, is not the same as specifying a certain unitary transformation. So you really should be careful to ask uh, our optimization program to do the right thing. And in particular, what we can say is we want a time-dependent Hamiltonian with modulated phases so that the evolution in that pulse corresponds to a particular unitary transformation everywhere in this passband. Uh, this kind of, of uh, uh, optimal control approach can do that. And if we do that, then we can make 